the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me. and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. Join the full throng, wake harp and psalter and song. Sound forth in glad adoration. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first scripture lesson is from Isaiah chapter 35, beginning at verse 1. The desert and the parched land will be glad, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom, it will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, for God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the new tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs, and the haunts where jackals once lay grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And the highway will be there, called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it, it will not be for those it will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there. Nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The epistle lesson is from James chapter 5, beginning at verse 7. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield this valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and how have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord 
is full of compassion and mercy. Alleluia, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Alleluia. So we do hear from Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 2. When John heard in prison that Jesus, what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Here ends the Gospel lesson.
Or maybe in the 1960s, uh, you were told that um, the United States is going to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And you followed the space program, and you saw how uh, different steps were taken to carry that out. And then on July 20th, 1969, you're watching on your television, probably in black and white, and you see with your eyes the moon landing. And you believe that it's real. And then your Uncle Ed says at his birthday party, they're not on the moon, they're in Canada. <laughs> you start to have doubts. And then as the years go by, others start to question the, the veracity, the truthfulness of that all that happened the way we were told that it happened. Some people are still aren't 100% sure on that one, if it happened or not. We're not going to question that. We're just going to say, for some people, they really believed it was true, and then their Uncle Ed said something, and then they weren't so sure. And then maybe it was reconfirmed that it was true, but maybe not. As Christians, a lot of who we are as Christians and, and our relationship with God depends on faith, trusting in what our God has told us in the Bible. And it tells us many wonderful things, the things that we believe since we are raised in the, what we believe to be the truths of God's Word. And yet at times, scoffers will come and make fun of the teachings of Scripture, and we ourselves might start to think, I wonder if it really happened the way I was told it happened. And we might have doubts. We might have concerns. And we might feel bad about that because it is doubt, doubt in what God's Word says, and we might look for help. And today we see an example of help that God gives. Because there was a man whom you would not have thought would have doubted anything that God ever told him, and yet it certainly sounds as though he has some questions about the truthfulness of what he himself had been saying to people. And that person is John the Baptist. And the message that he had proclaimed was that Jesus is the one who was to come. And yet you see here in our gospel lesson, John sending his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who was to come? Or should we look for someone else? And the way in which Jesus responds to that question should give us confidence that when we have doubts, that our God can and does speak to our hearts to strengthen our faith in what is true, and that is God's Word. We are told that John was in prison, and while he was in prison, he heard that Christ was what Christ was doing, he heard reports about Christ. And I think you know why John was in prison. In the culture at that time, the, one of the political rulers, there was people in different categories of a ruling, such as we have like governors of states and the president of the United States. So in that area, a, a particular province of Galilee was ruled by a man named Herod Antipas, who was called a king, but not completely a king. Herod was not a good man. And one of the things that he had done that was evil was that in his immorality, he had taken his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, to be his own wife. So he's committing adultery. And that doesn't really surprise us, I guess. Political rulers and other leaders do at times make sinful choices and live in sinful ways, and adultery would be one of those things. Even in our society today, uh, people who are celebrities don't always live um, God-fearing lives. But in our society, it, it seems as though many times it's just nod, nod, wink, wink, uh, it's your life, do what you want don't speak against it, and the people that do speak against it aren't at risk. But in the culture at that time, many people disagreed with what Herod was doing, but they were too afraid to say anything. Because when John did confront Herod and call the sin a sin, and call on him to repent, Herod responded by silencing John. You're going to go around the countryside telling people that what I'm doing is wrong, and, you know, single, single, pointing out, I'm going to put you in prison. So that's, that's why John was in prison, to silence him, to keep him from saying what he was about to hear it. And so while John was in prison awaiting his fate, he didn't know what it was going to be. Herod hadn't made up his mind yet. 
he's hearing reports about what Jesus is doing. Jesus is carrying out his ministry in Galilee. And as he hears what Jesus is doing, this question comes up. Is Jesus the one who was to come? Or should we look for someone else? Now some commentators, when they look at this, say, well, there's no way that John had any doubts. He's just too strong of a man of faith. His testimony concerning Christ was so solid earlier in his life, not that long ago. He, there's no way he could ever have a, a doubt or a question. And so John is sending his disciples to ask his questions because John wants his disciples to be reassured. I don't know if I completely agree with that assumption because of what Jesus says concerning John. He says, blessed is one who does not fall away on account of me. So I think Jesus realized that, that John is struggling a little bit, maybe quite a bit. But when that question comes to Jesus, it is from John, and I think we should take it as John asking, are you the one? How does Jesus respond? He goes to Scripture. He goes to Old Testament passages, which John knew, which we heard earlier in the worship service in Isaiah, which we read in the Psalms, and in those passages, it had been prophesied that when the one who was to come came, he would be doing certain things. There would be miracles that he'd be carrying out, very specific miracles, and he would also be proclaiming the good news to the poor. And John knew that, and so <clears throat> Jesus says, go back and tell him what's going on. The blind receive sight. And you read in the Gospel, you hear the miracles of Jesus, and that was certainly one of the miracles that Jesus did on more than one occasion. The lame walk, we think of Jesus healing people who have been crippled, some of them from birth, who had never been able to walk their entire lives. And then the power of Jesus, um, they were healed and, and they could walk. Uh, those who have leprosy are cured, we think of the ten lepers, it's often the gospel lesson for Thanksgiving. The deaf here, the dead are raised. Lazarus had not been raised from the dead yet, but there were others who had been, like the widow's son at Nain had been raised, uh, the daughter of Jairus. And the good news is preached to the poor. So what Jesus is saying is, okay, tell John, you know these passages, you know these prophecies, predictions of, of what the Messiah would be doing, the anointed one of God, and I am doing these things. So the logical conclusion is, I am the one who was to come. And so Jesus shows love and concern for John so that his faith may be strengthened because everybody's faith needs strengthening and, and John was probably becoming more and more anxious as the days went by. A man asked me once, and I can't remember exactly what the whole circumstances were, but a man I didn't really know, we were just starting to have a conversation and talking seemed like a very random question at the time. He says, uh, Pastor, have you ever been in jail? And I thought, I don't really know you, and I'm not so sure that I want to tell you, but I have not been in jail. I've not been in jail. I've not been in prison. But I, I know enough about um, reading about other people in the Bible and other history to um, people that are in jail. It's, it's a difficult situation. And depending on why they are there, and, and what the future might hold, I can see that, that being confined, especially if you're awaiting trial and you don't know what the outcome is going to be, or if a sentence has been given and you were innocent but you were falsely accused and convicted, and, and so it's an unjust imprisonment, that that could really weigh heavily on a person, and, and that's the situation John was in. He didn't do anything wrong in God's eyes to be in prison. He was doing what God had sent him to do, to go tell me to repent. And that's what John had done. And as a result, he gets in prison. And he didn't know what the future was. Herod was not a person that could be trusted. And what were the possibilities in the future? Maybe he would let John go. Maybe he would punish John severely. We know from the Bible that it did not turn out well for John at all. Not long after that, as a result of a, a, an oath that Herod had made in a party, his birthday party, John was beheaded. 
at the time, John didn't know that was going to happen when he's asking this question, but that is what's going to happen. And so maybe there's that thought that John, he's, he's languishing in prison, he's waiting for his outcome, and he's talking about one will come after me, who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, and he will come to judge the nations. And maybe he thought that Jesus was going to do that during Jesus' public ministry, and that John should be freed by Jesus, and that Herod should be dealt with, and that the new kingdom should be ushered in. And it wasn't happening, so he was perhaps getting somewhat impatient. But Jesus reassures him. This is what scripture says I would be doing. This is what I am doing. How did John respond to that? John's disciples, I'm sure, came back with the very message that we have before us today, probably said it word for word. What impact did that have on John's faith? We don't know. <coughs> We are told. There's not a narrative in Matthew. And so John's disciples returned to him and said to him everything Jesus had said. And John the Baptist bowed his head and said, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. We don't have that. I think we would be right in assuming that John's faith was strengthened, that his spirits were raised, that he gave glory to God, that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. But we're not told that. But I think it's a correct assumption that that he was strengthened. We have doubts sometimes. There's a point that maybe you remember the day that you discovered that a lot of those imaginative stories that you were told about secular Christmas weren't exactly as you had been led to believe. And struggle with that for a little bit and, and realize why you had been told those things that it was meant to be a fun thing, not to trick you. There are still people today that have some doubts about what really did or did not happen on the moon. People kind of struggle with that. In the long run, that doesn't really matter. But as Christians, we are told some fantastic things in the Bible. Things that, quite frankly, are very hard to believe. God created everything, the entire universe, in just six days, about six to 10,000 years ago, when all the evidence seems to be contrary to that in science. God destroyed the world with a flood and saved only those who were on this ark that Noah and his family had built. God came down from heaven in the form of a baby who was born in Bethlehem and laid in a manger. And even though he died on the cross, he rose again and is still alive and ruling over all things for the church. These things are hard to believe. The promise that Jesus will come again on the last day. Some people have struggled with that. Even in the early days of Christianity, we forget sometimes that the belief that Jesus was going to return in all of his glory was so strong that many people believed it was going to happen during their lifetime. It was going to happen a generation after Jesus ascended into heaven. But Jesus didn't come back then, did he? And there were those who scoffed at that. And Peter wrote to a group of Christians who were starting to have doubts about the truthfulness of the return of Jesus, maybe the truthfulness of other events too in the Bible. And so he writes this. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. And so what he's saying is, you have learned the truth. I've been telling you this throughout my ministry. I keep reminding you of these things, and I'm going to make every effort so that after I depart, after I die, 
you'll still be able to, to read about these things. And so that's why he's writing this letter, um, 2 Peter. And then he tells them that even though there were people who were scoffing and accusing Christians of making stuff up, even as today there are those who say that teachings on creation and a worldwide flood and the resurrection of Jesus are, are made up, Peter has this to say, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he talks about how he saw the glory of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased. Is Jesus the one who was to come or should we look for someone else? Peter would say, we, saw, we heard God himself tell us that Jesus is the one. We ourselves heard this voice that came down from heaven when we were with them on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so it, Peter's line of, of thought is the same line of thought that Jesus had in responding to John and his doubts. If you have doubts about the truthfulness of Scripture, if there are people that are accusing us of following cleverly invented stories, if there are people, Peter also writes about this, if there are people scoffing and saying, where is this coming that Jesus has promised ever since the world began and things have gone the same way? And Peter says, no, they haven't gone the same way because the world was once destroyed by a flood and will be destroyed again by fire. Uh, but Peter says, go back to Scripture. Go back to the scripture that's being written by Peter, as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Go back to Old Testament scripture. People carried along by the Holy Spirit. And trust that the Bible that we have, the Word of God, its source is God Himself. And God does not lie. And even though it's beyond our human understanding, and tells us incredible things that normally don't happen, we can trust that these things happen because it is the Word of God that tells us that they did. And so when we have doubts, when there are those who question our faith, when we wonder, is Jesus really the one who was to come? Did these things happen the way the Bible says? Is he coming again on the last day in all this glory? Go to God. Go to God in His Word and trust that Scripture, that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And that it is the power of God unto the salvation for everyone who believes. And that God's Word is living and active. And have the Word of God testify in your heart. Because the Holy Spirit is living in that Word to give you strength in the midst of whatever doubts you may have. We can trust that when John heard this, his faith was strengthened. We can trust that when we use God's word, our faith is strengthened as well. At the end of the Gospel of John, John tells us the purpose of the Bible. He said, Jesus did many other miraculous signs that are not recorded in this book. So, we know of Jesus raising the dead and giving sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and causing the lame to walk. Um, we know some of those miracles, but John says he did many other miracles, not even in the Bible. He also says that the, all the things Jesus did were written, the world wouldn't be able to contain all that. So it's just amazing how much Jesus did. But John says, these things that are written, talking about what he wrote in John, are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, we may have light in his name. May God continue to bless his word in our lives, 
May we continue to use it on a regular basis so that our faith can continue to become stronger and stronger. Amen. And please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds with faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, you tell us many things in your word about what has happened in the past, about your great love for mankind, about our relationship with you, all centered on your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who was to come, the one who came into our world and fulfilled your work of saving us from our sins by his life, death, and resurrection. At times, doubts may arise from our own sinful hearts, from the world around us, even from the devil. When that happens, you turn us again to the sure promises of your word and speak to us through the Holy Spirit so that our faith may be strengthened, that we may be guided in all holiness. Empower us also so that just as Jesus proclaimed the good news to the poor, we too today may proclaim that good news of Jesus Christ to those in our lives. We ask this in his name. Amen. In trying God, as Ed and Barb Solinsky celebrate their 51st wedding anniversary, accept our heartfelt thanks for all the blessings they have received. As companions on the journey through life, they have loved, consoled, and supported each other. But most important, they have grown closer to you. By your grace, they have maintained a Christian home and raised their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. They have learned forgiveness and unconditional love from you. Your word has been a lamp to their feet and a light to their path. Keep them committed to each other and to you. Continue to supply their earthly needs according to your will. And give them joy in the years to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has also taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor. Give you peace.